All right, we're just going to wait a few moments and let people uh, get signed on or signed in, and then we'll get going. Okay, well, welcome again, and thank you for joining us today as we share the barriers that exist in the organic field piece supply chain in Canada and explore strategies to overcome those barriers. My name is Marla Carlson, and I'm chair of the Organic Value Chain Advisory Committee, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. The Canadian Organic Growers Office is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We recognize and honor the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. I'm calling in today from Regina, Saskatchewan, situated on Treaty 4, the traditional home of the Nihiawak, the Anishinaabeg, Dakota, Lakota, Nakoda, and the homeland of the Métis Michi nations. We acknowledge the historical and ongoing oppression of land, cultures, and Indigenous peoples in what we now know as Canada. As an initial first step towards reconciliation, we encourage you to learn about the history of the land where you live. Please visit www.whose.land. We're going to start off with um, just a few housekeeping, um, a few housekeeping hints and tips so that you can get the most out of this webinar. Um, so first off, we're pleased to be uh, providing simultaneous interpretation in French today. So you can access the French interpretation uh, if you click on the icon at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little globe and choose the French channel. If you have any questions as we're going through uh, the webinar today, uh, please put those in the Q&A box. And we'd also encourage you to use the chat function, introduce yourself, um, and yeah, if you start a conversation there, that's always great too. Uh, so we encourage you to do that. So now I'll we'll introduce the topic for today. So today we'll examine and discuss the challenges and opportunities within the Canadian organic field pea supply chain. These findings are from the Canadian Access Project, a two-year initiative by Canadian organic growers and managed by David Mazurgoulet as project lead. You can connect with David in the chat. I think he's already introduced himself. These findings are from the Canadian Access Project, a two-year initiative by, I'm oh, sorry, the project engaged stakeholders across the country to determine what barriers stand in the way of increasing production and sales of six organic crops or sectors. COG and their partners specifically examined carrots, beef, blueberries, salad greens, oats, and today's field peas. The Canadian Access Project is funded by the Government of Canada through the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Canadian Agricultural Strategic Priorities Program, a $50.3 million five-year investment to help the agricultural sector adapt and remain competitive. And now before we get rolling and I pass it over to Don, I think we're gonna throw up a quick poll because we're super interested in who's here today and just which part of the value chain is represented on the webinar today, thank you. So we'll just take, leave that up for a few seconds. Just give everybody an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself. And seconds feel like minutes. <laughs> when you're on a webinar waiting. There we go. Excellent. Nice. So we have a really great cross section of uh, representation today, which is excellent and very reflective of the sector itself. Um, so thank you all for being here. You can see, yeah, it's, it's great to have you. All right. And now why we're all here. So joining us today, we have one of the project contributors, Don Murray, Senior Consultant with Harry Cummings and Associates. We also have Christine and Harry uh, who are here today as well. So thank you all for being here. Don will present the, the findings of the research and propose strategies to overcome barriers, work that was conducted on behalf of the Canadian organic growers. So over to you, Don. Thanks, Marla, and welcome everyone. And thanks for taking a bit of time out of your day to to uh, join us today as we sort of um, walk you through what we found through our study looking at the supply chain barriers um, as they relate to organic field pea production in Canada. Um, as part of our research process, uh, we used a variety of techniques in our data collection. Primarily, uh, a key part of that was our 
uh, interviews with key informants across Canada uh, with producers who are in directly involved in growing organic field peas and other relevant stakeholders in the supply chain. So distributors, handlers, millers, researchers, and so on. Um, our outreach to this group um, was done in coordination with the Organic Value Chain Advisory Committee. Um, that group helped populate a contact list for us uh, of potential candidates for us to reach out to and invite to participate in an interview. Um, so initially we reached out to about 23 stakeholders that were on that contact list and 14 stakeholders um, took us up on the offer and participated in a semi-structured interview. That group of 14 included seven producers, along with seven or along with five um, interests that were involved in marketing and milling um, organic field peas. One researcher and also one organic sector development specialist was sort of included in that group that we interviewed. Um, the seven producers that we spoke to represent or reflect a mix of, of different farm sizes. Um, several of the producers are farming on less than a thousand acres, but at least two of the producers were on, on more sizable farms where they were where they were growing crops on 2000 acres or more. That was their total land base when it comes to the organic uh, field pea production activity. The acreage was in most cases, you know, under 100 acres, but there were again a couple of producers that were uh, producing in excess of, of uh, 400 acres of organic field peas. The producers that we spoke to represent five different provinces, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Quebec, and Prince Edward, Prince Edward Island. And not surprisingly, producers are not, you know, these producers are not growing um, um, just organic peas. Um, they are commonly also growing oats, wheat, barley, rye, and to some lesser extent, uh, lentils, oil seeds. Uh, at least one individual is also growing corn and um, uh, cover crops like alfalfa and red clover as well were mentioned. Um, another important uh, component of our data collection were, was a, uh, a, a, a Eastern Ontario supply chain panel that was conducted last year, uh, which featured uh, relevant stakeholders that included grain handlers, distributors, value-added bakeries, uh, and livestock feed mills. Um, uh, so that uh, that was a focus on grain grain activity, and then another important uh, data element was the National Survey of Organic Sector Stakeholders. Again, this was conducted last year in March. It was national in scope. It was organized through a um, tri organization collaboration between COG, uh, the Canadian Organic Trade Association, and the Organic Federation of Canada. Again, looking at important data gaps in in the organic sector. And there were a number of select questions related to barriers or challenges with supply chain on that, on that survey. Um, there were a total of 370 stakeholders across Canada that responded and at least 200 of those uh, were, were producers that were involved in some form of crop production. So although the survey did not focus specifically on organic field peas, many of the findings uh, served to reinforce and validate the theme that came out of our other sort of data collection elements with the with the key informant interviews that we conducted and with the, with the uh, uh, organic supply chain panel in Eastern Canada. Um, there was also um, a panel that was put together for the Guelph Organic Conference um, last year. We had a round table discussion on supply chain barriers and that featured again, a select number of guest speakers talking about the supply chain barriers that they were encountering. And there was also 50 attendees that uh, sat in on that session virtually and were polled on a series of questions related to uh, what they were seeing as being key uh, supply chain barriers. Again, um, the round table didn't specific, specifically focus on organic field peas, but the, the findings in, uh, were really, again, relevant in the sense that they reinforced and helped validate themes that were coming out of our, our other sort of research methods. We also had a look at uh, relevant documents and literature um, to, to assist us in developing a profile of the organic pea sector. And again, identifying con and confirming um, the various sort of supply chain barriers and challenges. So that was our, our research approach. I wanna start, uh, before we get into the barriers, just have a, a quick um, look at a snapshot of organic field pea production in Canada. 
and even having a look before that at the sort of the composite picture of organic and non-organic production in Canada. What is, you know, what is going on with, with field pea production in Canada? So in 2021, the total harvest area of field peas was almost 3.7 million acres. Again, this is organic and non-organic combined. And that number is down a little bit from 4.2 million acres in both 2020 and 2019. Um, the, the total production weight uh, associated with that acreage in, um, in uh, 2021 fell by almost 51% from the previous year, uh, from about 5 million tons to 2.5 million, million tons. And that drop off in production was partly the result of a lower harvest area in 2021, but mainly it was due to lower yields that were driven by, uh, by drought conditions in Western Canada. And this showed up in the, um, in the organic field P, P, P data as well. So it was consistent with, um, with that, the organic sector. Um, yellow and green pea varieties have been the most common varieties produced in Canada, uh, with yellow peas accounting for about 78% of the production and green peas accounting for about 21% of the production. And then there are a variety of other peas that are produced for smaller markets, um, including Austrian winter, dun, uh, maple, and marrow fat. Uh, but really, it's the yellow pea and the green pea varieties that are the dominant uh, peas produced in Canada. When we look um, more specifically at the organic field pea production, and this is data that was provided by the certifying bodies, uh, they collect and aggregate and report on this data a bit differently. So it's um, these numbers are sort of very much approximate, but it does give us help us get a sense of the size and scale of organic um, field production in Canada. Um, in 2020, there were a total of 841 operators. Um, that reported they were producing organic field peas. This was down from 894 producers in uh, 2019. Um, total production area of organic field peas in 2020 was um, almost 137,000 acres. And this was down from almost 144,000 acres in 2019. Now, while the um, the producers are largely concentrated in three provinces, Alberta, which accounts for about 30% of the organic producers, Saskatchewan, 25% of the organic producers, and Ontario, 25% of the organic producers. The large majority of production is concentrated in just Alberta and Saskatchewan, Alberta accounting for about 40% of the production, and Saskatchewan, about 38% of the production. Um, so although we found that um, organic field peas are being grown in every province. It is largely concentrated in, in, in the prairie provinces and in particular Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, Manitoba has a relatively small organic sector compared to the other prairie provinces, uh, but the sector has shown healthy growth in recent years and interest in pea production in particular is growing with the development and expansion of local processing capacity. And we'll talk a bit more about that um, uh, as we get deeper into our presentation. Um, the other thing to, that's important to note about pea production is that um, the totals, the figures that I've been talking about with the organic field pea production, um, this includes field peas that are grown on their own and as well peas that are grown in combination with other crops. It's difficult to accurately determine the extent to which, um, you know, what, what is that makeup of peas grown on their own versus peas grown in combination with other crops. We have some data on it. It will be presented um, in the in the detailed report, uh, but again, because the different certifying bodies collect, aggregate, and report on this information a bit differently, um, it's it's somewhat inexact. But it um, we do, we do provide a bit more detail on that in the report. It appears that the most common or the most common combination crop though is oats um, by far, but other crops have been reported as combination crops, including barley, wheat, triticale and rye. The other thing that the um, production data that we have on the organic field production or field pea production, um, uh, also I want to, that we, we don't, we're not able to determine or specify, you know, the end use of this product. So is it going to seed? Is it going for food grade peas? Is the destination for livestock feed or simply as a plow down crop? We're not able to say you know, of that production that's coming off in any given year, where's the, um, where's the destination? 
uh, how is that sort of divided across those different markets, potential markets, or being used internally on the farm as a plow down crop. When we look at the organic field P uh, farm gate value, again, it, you know, it's, we don't have an exact sales value of organic field peas. Um, this is not something that is captured through Statistics Canada, and it's not something that's captured through the certifying bodies. And so we've tried to come up with an approximate number or a rough estimate of what that value might be using production and price parameters prepared by, by different sort of government agencies. And so, for example, in 2022, um, you know, cost of organic production templates prepared by the government of Manitoba, they used an average gross revenue figure for organic field peas of $260 per acre, right? And that's based on an average yield of approximately 20 bushels per acre and a price of $13 per bushel. And so then if we even just conservatively estimate that 75% of the organic field peas produced in Canada in 2020 were harvested and sold off the farm. So that would be a, a little over 100,000 acres in total. And then we apply that return value of $260 per acre for that production. We would then sort of project that the total farm gate value of organic field pea, field pea production in Canada to be potentially as high as $26.7 million. Now, we have to appreciate this is very much a moving target because um, I was looking at the 2022 cost of organic production templates prepared by the government of Manitoba that just came out um, this month. And this year, they're, they're suggesting that the um, uh, per bushel price is, 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 is for this year is $20.50. So it's gone up a third over what was reported in, the, um, in their template in 2020. Um, the other thing I would sort of just touch on here is also the value of organic field pea exports. We do have um, some data on this. Uh, peas represent a major export commodity for Canada. And specifically as it relates to organic field peas in 2020, the total value of certified organic yellow peas other than seed for sowing amounted to 21.4 million. Um, this was up from 19.2 million in 2019 and uh, 21.2 million in 2018, uh, but down uh, from uh, 33.5 million in 2017. Um, now, approximately 90% of the total certified organic ELP export quantity was directed at two countries in 2020, and that was China and the United States. China, by far, taking the bulk of that at 85%, and the US, 5%. And these two countries have consistently accounted for about 75% or more of organic field pea exports, yellow field pea exports since 2018. Um, but in 2020, certified organic field peas were exported to over a dozen additional countries, including Morocco, Belgium, Colombia, Nepal, Philippines, and Fiji. We don't have um, retail sales data associated with organic field pea products. Um, the potential categories where, where field protein, fiber, and starch is what it's going into, uh, quite complex. And we, we don't really have a, a, a figure on retail sales data to save or to share, at least not at this time. Great. So let's have a look at some of these. Um, uh, supply chain barriers that sort of came up, the major themes that we came across during the discussions and a look at the data that was at our, at our fingertips. Starting with issues and concerns around the cost um, of transitioning to and maintaining org organic standards, which is seen as being costly and challenging. Issues around the amount of time and the resource commitment to acquire and adopt new knowledge and practices related to organic production, and even sort of the, um, the challenge of, of marketing and, and finding and securing marketing channels can be an issue for some producers, depending upon where they're located and the types of processing or infrastructure that's, that's in their area. Uh, producers also touched on the issue of um, you know, the, the challenge of experience experiencing or dealing with reduced cash flow during that transition period, which could take three to five years, uh, having to deal with lower yields before a premium price can be captured on that certified organic label. Now, um, 
producers did talk about a number of advantages that they sort of associate with growing fuel peat. And I'd like to sort of talk about these before I sort of get into what the sort of the, the challenges are in terms of, you know, growing this particular crop. Um, but it is sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a, a promising and beneficial crop to some producers because it is, for one, it has many uses, many very sort of varied markets. It can be as a, as a food grade, grade product. Um, it can be used as a green manure. It can be used as a grain that goes towards livestock or pet food. Um, and in particular, with a, with, as a livestock food, um, you know, unprocessed feed can be fed directly to livestock, unlike soybeans. So it sort of has a, a value-added component in, in that way, in that it doesn't need that extra processing to be used as a, as a grain. Um, other benefits are, you know, when, when used as, as green manure, field peas provide a substantial amount of nitrogen compared to other legumes like soybeans, check peas, and, and dry beans. And crops that follow a legume like peas in rotation experience a boost in yield. And again, this is linked to the, the nitrogen that's added to the soil and enhanced disease suppression and general soil improvement. Um, producers talked about field peas being a good companion crop with small grains like oats and barley as they provide a physical support for those bee, bee, uh, pea vines to climb. And it promotes better airflow and minimizes uh, mold growth. However, some producers have struggled to make organic peas work in their setting or their production system. Uh, producers have faced a challenge in some areas of identifying a crop rotation that works for their particular needs, uh, depending upon their soil and, and uh, climate conditions. And they have to work in crops that address, you know, what the, the, this, the current soil health is and what their weed management issues are, even sort of issues around uh, any uh, water, ir water sort of um, uh, deficiencies in the area. Um, producers noted that weeds can be a problem as peas are slow to emerge. Um, and if peas are not controlled during a year in which they're grown, they can carry over into the following year. So again, a talk producers talked about the importance of putting a companion crop in there that is fast to germinate, provides a quick ground cover, and sort of gets ahead of, of the weeds and helps suppress or choke back some of those weeds as the peas develop. One producer expressed concern about actually expanding their, pre, their pea production um, onto their heavier soils and concerns over disease issues. Uh, another issue was that was raised was the fact that mature pea pods um, typically can shatter very easily when they're dry, and so harvesting must be done very carefully to, to reduce that shattering. There are also some concerns around the price return on peas. Um, uh, some producers have observed that there have been some, some price fluctuations, and in some cases, you know, they've, they've noted that the price just simply is not enough to cover costs. Um, and that there's an ongoing battle right now for acres. And one producer noted that um, they've observed as much as 30,000 acres of organic, organic crop returning to conventional production. However, there are also some suspicions that perhaps those that sort of converted to organic, um, you know, maybe they're, um, those that are leaving probably may not have been, should have been involved in organic in the, in the, in the first place, right? If they actually, actually haven't sort of bought fully into the philosophy and were perhaps there to sort of make a, a profit off the off the trending um, consumer interest in organic. At least uh, two stakeholders commented on the idea of providing uh, organic producers with some form of compensation as they transition to organic, again, to help them get over that hurdle of, of uh, weathering a, a lower price until they get that, uh, they're able to put that organic brand on their product. Uh, one Miller, in fact, noted that um, they did experiment with paying farmers a premium to help them through the transition period. Uh, but with that, though, there was an expectation that this cost would be recovered by the mill through some form of a transition fee once the organic status was achieved. But ultimately, the, the Miller sort of backed away from that initiative as it seemed to be penalizing the producer uh, at the time they, they achieved their certification. Record keeping came up. Um, in our discussions, but um, interestingly, many of the producers we spoke with view the record keeping that's associated with maintaining certification as an important and valuable feature of, of the organic sector, right? So producers commented that it, it, you know, the record keeping is making them better farmers as they become, they've become more detail oriented 
and they can track their activities and their breakthrough events over time. However, one producer did emphasize that it's important to, um, to mentor the staff and the hired help to ensure that they are diligent in recording everything. New staff really do need to grasp the importance of complete and accurate record keeping immediately and internalize that as part of their job responsibility. Uh, another producer emphasized that certifying bodies need to ensure that they have knowledgeable inspectors that have a strong grasp of their responsibilities, are familiar with farm practices, and are in touch with the realities of production. Um, there's also a feeling that the certifying bodies could and, and should be playing an expanded role in providing mentoring, training, and guidance to producers um, to ensure that you know, um, if there are best practices that the producer is not aware of or should be aware of, that information is, is transferred through those, through those bodies. Um, in terms of support and extension services, several producers commented on the loss of government supported rural extension services and field research stations that historically have provided valuable service. Um, for example, in testing seed varieties and um, um, crop management practices for local conditions. Several producers observed that they have found their organic community and or provincial or regional vacuum associations, or sorry, regional organic associations to fill some of that vacuum uh, in that they're helpful and they're willing to share information. But when the information they're in need of isn't available from these groups, um, they're finding that what's available from other sources, be it an academic research institution or government, it's typically not specific to organic and or relevant to the region, or it's too technical, or there might even be a cost factor that, that interferes with their ability to access that information. Interestingly, um, when we were talking with millers um, um, and processors, um, they've taken on some of an expanded role in providing guidance and advice. Uh, for example, the new pea processing plant that was established in Roquette, um, Manitoba, established by Raquette in Manitoba, uh, provides support to pea growers through their agronomy team, which includes an organic agronomist. And they provide information on crop rotation planning, seed selection, uh, crop establishment strategies, pest control, and even harvest and, and storage uh, information. Um, some regions noted that they have been fortunate that uh, other organizations have sort of stepped into a, um, a, a role of research and carried on an advisory role. For example, um, in Northern Alberta, the Mackenzie Applied Research Association, um, it's, which is a former experimental uh, farm of the federal government. It was taken over by Mackenzie County as a not-for-profit. They're looking into a five-year sort of a, a research initiative um, examining ways to maximize um, rotation crops. Now, a couple of producers also talked about that there is some good support coming out of out of universities. Uh, for example, the University of Manitoba it was noted has an organic specialist, and stakeholders have informed an informal group of organic farmers that share information with and through that individual. This issue of the cost of transitioning and maintaining org organic standards uh, came up as a major issue in the national survey that was conducted as well. And almost a third of the, the survey respondents indicated that this is a significant challenge um, uh, for the industry. In terms of strategies going forward, I mean, we think it's important to develop and strengthen knowledge transfer points to ensure access uh, to information is convenient and affordable. Information on transitioning to organic and ongoing advancements in production, processing, and marketing should be organized and consolidated for easy and efficient access. And there is a need for collaboration from producer, stakeholder agencies, certifying bodies, research institutions, and government um, to reinvest, we feel, to reinvest in extension services for the organic sector and ensuring that, that is, um, those services are provided in a timely manner, the information is relevant to local conditions, and it is easy, user-friendly to access. I think there's also a role for the certification bodies to continue to work to ensure that um, their processes, their mechanisms are easy to navigate, they're efficient and consistent where possible, trying to reduce the paperwork. 
And also, um, if they're not doing so already, looking at integrating an online platform to allow documents to be updated annually with pre-populated data fields. So if the farm isn't sort of really undergoing a major change in terms of their production activities, the acreage types of crops, um, you know, ideally some of that data could be carried over as opposed to having to go in and re-enter re every data field. So some smart functioning perhaps being built into an online platform to, to allow information to be carried forward from previous years to help, to, help um, to, to efficiently sort of go through that application process or the documentation. Um, there's also a role for, I think that, um, that the government needs to take a role or a look at the regulatory mechanisms, reviewing those and enhancing those regulatory mechanisms. Um, and uh, one producer actually pointed out the need for greater political leadership and limiting and reducing regulatory mechanisms that contribute to cost. Uh, for example, the cost of preparing and adhering to nutrient management plans. And ultimately that's sort of falling on the shoulder of the producer. And it's not something that can be easily passed on to the consumer. So is there any way that those costs could be shouldered um, uh, by the government or, or limited? Right, so the question of, or the issue of access to and the affordability of organic farm inputs also came across as a major theme when we're looking at the supply barriers. And kind of at the top of the list was the, um, the issue surrounding organic seed availability, the appropriateness of the seed and its cost. Seed variety selection um, is a key factor in producing high yielding, high quality peas. Um, varieties vary in yield potential, resistance to lodging, susceptibility to seed coat damage and dimpling, resistance to bleaching, time to maturity, and disease resistance. So, I, and, and a number of factors have to be taken into consideration when choosing a field pea variety for local conditions, including the climate, soil type, disease pressure, and the other crops that might be in rotation. And, and also its end use, right? Is this going into a, a food grade pea? Is it going into forage production? Is it going into a green manure? Um, and there's also a need for producers to be aware of the preferences in the marketplace. So what are the millers looking for? Are there any specifications around the, the, the type of, of pea products they're, they're looking for, right? And again, the, for example, the new pea process, processing plants, um, the rocket plant in Manitoba, it is continuing to purchase all variety of peas, um, but special premiums are, are available for certain sort of preferred varieties. So it's important that producers have a look at what those uh, buyers are interested in and um, being aware of how that changes from year to year. Several of the producers that we spoke to confirmed that they are using conventional untreated seed, um, which they can obtain uh, derogation, derogation from the certification body. But the challenges identified in accessing organic seed relate to one, the limited availability of specific varieties that the producer might be interested in. There could be an insufficient availability of quantity of a seed that's, that's of interest to, to a producer. And although price alone is not an acceptable reason for, for opting into using untreated conventional seed, the issue of the cost of organic seed came up again and again, right? And it's not, uh, producers were saying, you know, it is not uncommon that the price point is, you know, two times or more expensive than organic seed, which, you know, for some is simply for them, it just does not make economic sense to, 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 uh, to, to, to use the organic uh, option. Producers all talked, some of the producers all talk, also talked about their preference to sell all of their harvest uh, in order to get the maximum price for the organic product, rather than holding back to a component of their of their peas for seed, um, when it's you know again cheaper to buy the untreated conventional seeds for them from their standpoint, it was more economical to sell everything that came off the field than to hold some back uh, some of it back for seed. And another stakeholder noted that their preference is to use local seed um, that is adapted to known. Uh, adapted and known to perform well in their local conditions. And typically this is untreated conventional seed as um, organic seed is not always uh, locally grown. Um, part of the discussion we had with producers also was around this, um, the, the issue of there being a, a lack of market incentives to develop organic pedigree seed varieties. 
um, large seed suppliers that carry licenses for organic pedigree seed varieties, um, control production of these varieties, and the continued maintenance of any variety is vulnerable to their preferences, not the preferences or the needs of the producer, but really sort of other sort of internal decisions um, that are made by the large seed suppliers. Um, the development of organic pedigreed seed is further hampered by the relatively small size of the organic market. Um, one stakeholder emphasized that there is considerable risk associated with growing organic seed if the seed quality is not adequate and or there are problems with weed control, you know, it ultimately might have to go to a secondary market uh, like livestock feed. Uh, and then there's a severe sort of downgrade on the price as well. Um, several producers commented on the need for an organic seed production development model that runs parallel to, to the conventional seed model. Uh, there's concern that the regulations governing seed in, Cana in Canada are not favorable to the development of the organic seed market, and the systems are more oriented toward large-scale conventional production and proprietary research. Um, variety registration and pedigreed seed certification systems have a significant influence on the varieties of field crops available in the marketplace, and more allowances need to be made for organic trials of new varieties during the variety registration process. Uh, another concern around the use of the um, untreated conventional seed is this sort of um, what's happening, a notice of what's happening in the Euro European market, which is um, advocating that all grain must be grown from organic seed. And there's a somewhat of a concern that there's a risk of Canada being locked out of the European market if we continue to rely on conventional untreated seed. Um, crop insurance uh, also came up as an issue for some producers. Um, so some producers said, suggested that the insurance was adequate, but others sort of had, um, had concerns that it is not, um, not adequate for what it provides and is, is expensive for what it provides. Uh, one of the main concerns included the lack of comprehensive coverage for organic compared to what's offered to non-organic. Uh, a producer gave an example of the non-organic premium options uh, allowing for 80% coverage while the organic uh, premium um, had substantially less coverage, about 50% coverage. Uh, one producer also observed that um, they exp had experience where they, uh, you know, they had claimed crop insurance one year, insurance one year, and there was a hefty substantial or substantial surcharge that was added in, sub in subsequent years. And finally, let's just touch on, in terms of inputs, this, um, the issue of, 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 of equipment um, and the importance of having the right equipment and infrastructure. So one producer talked about the importance for organic producers to execute their production properly in order to get the maximum yield and return. And part of that process is, is, is ensuring that you've got the right equipment for that job one set of harrows is not necessarily going to be the most appropriate piece of equipment depending upon um, the season and the soil conditions and they have actually moved to a, a system where they have three different sets of harrows uh, heavy uh, mild and light uh, depending upon the need and they've also adopted the use of cameras in their production several producers also commented on the importance of having a dryer and or additional farm storage um, right, so it would be, and it would be helpful to have, if some sort of additional funding was available to organic producers to support their investment in drying equipment and storage infrastructure. Um, so looking at our strategies here, um, we would encourage and support collaboration between the organic industry research institutions um, and government to develop and sustain domestic organic seed research and breeding programs and encourage the federal and provincial government bodies to enhance insurance policies to better reflect the needs of organic farms. I'm gonna move on a couple of these barriers, um, pick up the pace a little bit. I realize we've got about 20 minutes left before the top of the hour, but um, land affordability and availability came up uh, as an issue. It, um, producers talked about land over the past 10 years, um, the price has gone up in some cases, both a producer on Eastern Canada and a producer in, in Western Canada 
I'd send the prices in the past 10 years have gone up tenfold, right? And even rented uh, farmland acreage is getting a, a little out of, out of control, uh, especially when that, that property or parcel of land that's being rented um, you know, may not have um, all the, the, the most desirable attributes in terms of either on-site infrastructure or its location might be so distant that you know, it's just not economical for, for the producer to haul their, their equipment X number of miles down the road to get to it. Um, um, so we, we've, we encountered a, a, a few producers that have indicated at this point, you know, their focus is trying to maximize returns on their existing land base rather than to think about expanding their land base and getting into a bidding war with, with farmers to buy up, to buy up uh, additional land. Um, a couple of producers also expressed concern about the number of corporate type farms that are showing up and buying large swaths uh, of land. And again, sort of cutting off the opportunity for organic farmers to buy or access smaller slices of land. Um, and where that uh, property is sort of, again, being brought up, bought up by, by new landowners, um, that even if it is being put on the rental market, again, the rate that's being charged is excessive. And again, just not something that's within the reach of or viable from the standpoint of an organic producer. This issue of land prices uh, came up uh, uh, in a very big way with a national survey and also with the Guelph Roundtable. So it's, it, and it's, it, it reflects every sort of component of the organic sector. So when we were talking with the carrot producers or the blueberry producers or the salad greens, land is a, is a, is a real sort of a pressing problem for producers when we're thinking about expansion. So how to sort of, how to address this, how to sort of combat this or begin to at least make some, some, some inroads on making this approachable and accessible. Well, one potential thing is to look at developing and supporting land matching programs to help organic producers find land uh, to purchase and ensure that this service is offered in conjunction with other relevant business support services. Some potential approaches to, to promoting this relate to include farm linking, uh, where we're pairing new organic farmers with retiring organic farmers, enabling those, those farms to sort of transfer to a next generation where there may not be a family bond. And also having that retiring farmer on hand to help mentor the young farmers and ensure that the business remains viable in those sort of early years of, of transfer. Also, there's um, uh, opportunities around cooperative, cooperative farming where a group of young farmers come together, they gain enough capital to buy or lease land um, that they can share. And potentially also looking at farmland trusts where a community or a concert conservancy group might raise funds to purchase environmentally important historic uh, and imperiled farms and then rent or, or some other agreement with young farmers um, who could then secure long-term leases to, to operate on that land. The issue of climate change and the related challenges came up as a barrier. Uh, producers have noted there's an increasing frequency of extreme weather events associated with climate change and it's impacting production activities and cycles and producers are having to adapt more quickly to changing conditions. Uh, several producers in Western Canada confirmed that they've experienced successive years of heat and drought, which have impacted yield. Um, in response to this, several producers noted that they're, they sort of look at regenerative farming approaches as a way to mitigate some of the severe impacts of climate change. Uh, for example, the maintenance of cover crops and green crops on landscape, which um, which aids in retaining more moisture and moderating the ground level temperature to promote greater resilience in extreme heat. Um, a couple of the producers, re producers really sort of emphasized and suggested that the organic sector needs to tap into regenerative farming approaches and avoid being left out of this conversation, right? Um, there's a feeling that the organic sector needs to be a, a major contributor to this conversation around regenerative farming and possibly even, you know, the leader in the conversation on regenerative farming and how it aligns with and supports organic, the organic approach. Um, it was also noted that some there appears to be growing interest among conventional producers in regenerative farming practices. And even though they're still using glyphosates and nitrogen fertilizers at this time, 
um, they're gaining an awareness of the benefits um, that regenerative farming provides to soil conditioning and, and savings with these practices. And it was suggested that regenerative farming might serve as an entry point to help conventional producers transition to organic. Um, it was also pointed out by producers that consumers have taken an interest in sustainable and regenerative farming systems. Uh, systems, and so again, another sort of branding or marketing point that that the organic sector could could tie into in terms of meeting the needs and interest of consumers. Um, one producer noted that the regenerative push is also sort of coming across through private and corporate sector interest in a very big way. Right. So they've identified initiatives that have been undertaken by General Mills, by PepsiCo, by Microsoft and others that are investing in promoting regenerative farming. Um, and it was suggested that protecting, you know, there's the involvement of the private sector is, is actually going to advance regenerative practices um, at a faster pace than, than government. Millers have also, when we were talking with Millers, also talked about their interest in, in um, in sourcing grains produced with um, or through regenerative production models, um, they value that approach and they actually want to also use that again as a marketing brand to their customer base. Um, so when we look at strategies around, um, around climate change and challenges, um, we feel there's a need to continue to support institutional research on climate resilience agriculture and ensure this research is relevant and accessible to producers. Producers need to have access to and be informed about climate adaptation best practices. It's important for them to be able to build their knowledge base and gain the confidence uh, in understanding these climate change events and the appropriate uh, practices. Um, there's also a need to continue to support enhanced collaboration between all relevant stakeholders to advance organic farming and regenerative farming systems. Um, and there's something else that sort of should be on the agenda as part of a, a part of an approach to uh, responding to, to climate change and challenges. In terms of access to markets, um, fair bit of variation in how producers were sort of experiencing challenges here. Generally, producers in Western Canada uh, are more pleased with their marketing options than was the case we found in Eastern Canada. Um, and a large part of this is related to the, the growth in some of the processing infrastructure that has sort of taken off in recent years and um, the availability of those markets. Um, uh, one producer observed that the growing interest in yellow peas directly is related to those processing plants that have been built in the last, uh, last few years. But also emphasize that even with that infrastructure in place, you know, if the if the mills aren't offering a price that's attractive, um, it's just not going to be enough to convince producers to make that switch to peas. Um, the price has to be at a point where it's where it makes economical sense. Don, I'm just going to jump in and and yep. say uh, about five minutes. Right. Yeah, to wrap it up. All right. Um. So. The important thing is the producers emphasize that they need to have a reliable, dependable buyer um, and that this appropriate milling infrastructure is crucial, but the price has to be at the point that makes economic sense as well. Um, and ensuring that there are linkages between, um, known linkages between the, the, the buyers and the, um, and, uh, and the producers so that the, uh, the producers have an, op an idea of what their options are. Uh, so from a strategy, standpoint, it's important to continue to facilitate and support communication and networking between producers and, bu and buyers to identify marketing and distribution opportunities, including effective transportation linkages. Um, and it's also important to encourage producers or processors to work with, as much as they're able to, more varied quality standards to reflect year-to-year -year variabilities in growing and harvesting conditions. It's very difficult to have equivalent quality from year to year, even field to field. And many factors are out of the hands of organic producers. And um, there's a desire or feeling among producers that um, the processing sector and consumers need to be more sensitive to these realities. Quickly on growth opportunities, um, as I mentioned earlier, major growth in, in uh, processing capacity uh, in Canada, in particular in Western Canada with a new facility that was built by Rocket 
but also um, new facilities that are that have been built by um, Verdient, Verdient Food in um, in Saskatchewan, Merit Functional Foods in, in Manitoba, and a few other places in Western Canada. Um, this this capacity has really grown in recent years in terms of providing some marketing options to um, to producers. That being said, I mean the bulk of of, or, of, uh, of pea production is still going into export markets. So there's a major growth opportunity for, for trying to capture more domestic uh, market value uh, as this sort of pea pre pre, uh, protein and, and pea uh, fiber, pea flour and pea starch products sort of take off and increasingly make their way into the, into the marketplace and onto the um, retail, retail, retail shelves. Another development of note quickly is, the, is Canada's protein industry supercluster. Excuse me. Part of a federal government initiative, which has put about 173 million into um, this supercluster to promote, um, you know, growing market activity in North America, Asia, and Europe for plant-based uh, meat alternatives and new food products. I just also want to quickly mention here at the end the concerns raised around. Um, potential devaluation of the organic brand in the marketplace uh, with a proliferation of, or ten, or, of alternative branding that closely aligns with organic. So those labels that are like non-GMO, naturally, sustainably grown, align with organic, but are not necessarily organic. Uh, but that proliferation of eco-friendly branding could result in market erosion for organic products. Um, and there's a feeling that we really need to take a, a greater stand at ensuring that the labeling that is being put on products is more truthful and accurate, and consumers um, then have that information to make informed decisions about, about um, what they're buying. So stressing the importance then of ensuring that, um, um, you know, that, that product, um, whatever the lab labeling is, enables consumers to easily differentiate organic from other um, from the non-organic options and there's an important role right for the relevant provincial and federal government agencies to monitor and regular regulate that eco-friendly marketing uh, to ensure that um, the, the messaging that is being put out there is truthful and not misleading so i'll leave it at that and we'll open this up to uh to questions thank you excellent thank you uh, so much, Don. Uh, just just have one question, but often when you ask the first question, others come in. So if you think of one uh, while I'm talking, please pop it into the Q and A box. Um, and so part of the project is about um, well replacing exports with domestic production, but also encouraging more domestic uh, production and consumption. And so, do you see this? Uh, like, is there opportunity here for field peas? Do you think, does your research indicate that? Or is it more about uh, it being a food ingredient, the peas, field peas? Well, it's, it can be, it can either be, I think, I think, there's, I think there's, there's both things here. I mean, the, just by chance the other day, I happened to pick up, I didn't even know it was sort of, um, they were making these, but it's sort of like a, a savory, all these savory snack items, which are the whole pea, mm -hmm. which might have a flavoring added to it, right? So I picked a product up the other day, which is simply roasted peas with a dill pickle flavoring. And I'm sure there's a variety of other flavors, but yeah. it's a 40 gram pack. And it was the first time I saw it on the shelf, but it's sort of, and this is made, uh, grown and made in Canada. So the labeling is quite sort of you know, robust in terms of where this is from. And I won't sort of do any product promotion here, but it was <laughs> interesting to see a, almost like a whole product coming on the market. It's just simply roasted peas with a with flavoring. Yeah. This particular product is, is not organic, but there's mm -hmm. no reason why it couldn't be. Yeah, no, for sure. That, that's, that's always the, the holy grail value-added processing in Canada. <laughs> and to get, to get the, the production and that processing as close together, that's often a reason why uh, we don't have as much value. It's growing in Saskatchewan, but why we don't have as much in Saskatchewan? We have lots of product, but few people to buy it. So uh, fewer people. Yeah, it's to also buy convincing it. the retail sector to give these products shelf space, right, over the other voices that are clamoring for their shelf space, right? Um, so are there concerns about you know retailers sort of their loyalty with their tried and true versus introducing a new product and and you know the willingness to sort of 
you know, this is this is a new a new snack. Like, how do you you know getting yeah. them in to, to come in on in this uh, as partners? Yeah, no, for sure. And I guess the um, the whole plant plant based food um, uh, interest will will help help with that a little bit. I'm thinking or hoping, and maybe switching gears just a little bit to just around agronomic support and. Uh, solutions or strategies for that has that come up in your research at all or suggestions for what that what that might look like um, not specific details other than the fact the service itself is mm -hmm. a bit sort of um ad hoc some areas they they have some strengths um either through a, a local research station that was taken over by local interest or the provincial association has a has a, a real sort of good in-house specialist or a university might have a, a really sort mm -hmm. of good in-house specialist who, who's approachable um then sort of that comes back to this issue of like it's not consolidated like where it needs to be tied together and almost like how where's the warehouse the clearinghouse where people can access this stuff and, and not feel like they're having to do a day and a half of search and then and, and not get to what they're actually intending to get to yeah, no, that that's very true. And there are a few websites like Pivot and Grow and and you know others that um, are trying to do that. But they're often um, projects like this that are funded for a particular you know period of time to develop resources. And then it's also the the next step about you know it's the one thing finding the research you know that that will help you um, you know grow grow your organic peas. But then it's that the the translation of that research to your farm situation right and and i think that in the non-organic farming world there's there's more uh, resources available to do that although they're often linked to input companies the the resources are still there to to kind of help help with that on farm uh translation right of yeah. of research so it and definitely and comes everyone's, up a lot. everyone's time is important time is money and so i can appreciate a producer wanting information on on seed selection or trying to get yeah. at an issue with dealing with disease and ideally they would love to be able to pick up a phone and talk with someone at the other end versus having to go through an internet based database yeah. and dealing with links that are dead um you know I, even in the process of us doing our lit review document review for this you know i mm -hmm. i would do follow up with links that the 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 site host has stopped updating information and there are a lot of dead ends yeah, no, yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it comes up all of the time. And I think it's like a, a, a challenge and an opportunity for provincial and national uh, industry associations to uh, strategize around it and, and see how we can uh, increase the support to organic farmers for sure across the country. Um, all right. I think, that, oh, there's one more question. Oh. What there's a question, what are export customers doing with the organic peas? Did you get a, a, a sense of that? That I, I don't know. I mean, I can, uh, I, I might uh, touch on that a bit more in the report. Um, mm -hmm. but that's a good point to bring up. I'll have a look at that right now. At this point, what I just all I know is that the market that it's going into as opposed to its end use. Yeah, and remind me. So the two the two big countries are China and and the China US. China and the United States account yeah. for roughly anywhere between seventy five to eighty percent. Yeah, yeah, and I just anecdotal anecdotally, I know um, you know. Interestingly, we seem to, to ship our peas off to to China, uh, you know, to be made into an in, in, into an ingredient or an end product, which is then shipped back to Canada for us to you know to consume and. I think the whole, you know, plant-based food, but also all of the the protein shakes now seem to use pea protein as a as a main, you know, a main ingredient. So my my guess is that that it's going elsewhere to be processed and is coming back as various, you know, protein yeah. shakes and bars and all the things that now have pea protein in them. So yep. yeah, so again, another you know, an opportunity, right? Um, and yep. that again, that's. That's anecdotal, um, just yeah. some things that I've heard. But. One quick stat here I didn't cover off in the presentation, it's in the report, but just during COVID-19, I mean, there was a, an, an uptick in, in, um, in plants-based protein sales in the meat case, if you like. So while the growth, well, you know, the beef sector itself, um, mm -hmm. beef sales rose by 27% in the, in the meat case. Um, 
But the best performer in the meat case was plant-based protein, where sales went up by 41%. Now, at this point, those, those plant-based protein products still only account for 4% of the total meat case volume. So it really highlights the opportunity for growth. Um, it had a surge in, in, in expanded sales, but it still accounts for a very small percentage. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a potential there to sort of take some more, uh, more of that market. Mm -hmm. And I think pet food is another big one. Just okay. popped into my, yeah, for sure. All right. Well, um, we don't have any more questions that have come in. So I think we will wrap it up as we're right at the top of the hour, uh, one o'clock, I think, Eastern time. So we'll close with thank yous. As always, thank you, Don, uh, Christine, and Harry for being here today, and Don for your presentation. Uh, the webinar is an important milestone for the project and for the for Canadian, the Canadian organic growers. We'd like to thank Harry Cummings Associates, the Can Canadian Organic Trade Association, and Sask Organics, as well as the many producers and stakeholders for their important contributions. We also want to acknowledge our appreciation for financial support provided by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. This is our final webinar of the series of six supply chain webinars. You can find all of the recordings and slides for the carrot, beef, blueberries, salad green and salad greens and oats webinars already up on the YouTube channel. Uh, and this one will be uh, there in two business days. So you'll have the full set that you can have a look at. Um, and if you've enjoyed today's webinar, please consider sharing the information um, about the, uh, the recordings on the YouTube channel uh, with your network. We would appreciate it. And finally, with this webinar series coming to a close, we have another event planned for next week on greenhouse gas emissions and regenerative organic agriculture with Dr. Chris Nichols. Uh, we will send out a poll that should appear on your screen and let us know if you would like to receive an email about that upcoming webinar. And with that, um, we will finish for today. Thank you again for being here and spending your time with us. <laughs>